Now, these days, the idea of submission sounds harsh, uh, and very few people understand really what the biblical understanding of submission is. And again, Christ is our example. And so as we look at this text this morning, the question last week was, well, if Christ-centered husbands choose to love their wives— if, if, if a Christ-centered husband chooses to love his wife unconditionally, sacrificially, and purifyingly, just as Christ loved the church, then how should a Christ-centered wife respond to that love? The answer, and this is our main idea this morning, a Christ-centered wife wisely chooses to lovingly submit to her husband, just as Christ lovingly submitted to his father consistently, respectfully, and cheerfully. And so our outline this morning, three things I just kind of want to work us through is one, let's look at and understand that it is a supernatural wisdom, the supernatural wisdom of submission that Paul points us to. Two, an answer to the question, what does submission actually mean? Or you might say, you want me to what? I thought I'd get more of an answer. A little, little bit of laugh there. That was third, our pattern of submission, a wife's pattern, but really our pattern as well. Jesus, and he's the example. He's, he's the example. He's always the reminder. He's always the means with which we point to. So let's look at the text. Let's look at the text. Uh, verse 15. One, the supernatural wisdom of submission. The supernatural wisdom of submission. I'm going to briefly work through this. This is, in the Bible, this is the longest treatment of marriage in the New Testament. If you want to see another text that Paul uh, uses the same instructions, it's Colossians chapter 3.18 uh, Paul uses very similar language, but it's very concise and to the point. This is the section where he fleshes out kind of what we were talking about weeks ago, that the, the, the template is Christ's love for the church. He talks about this is the mystery of the church. I'm not talking about just marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so there's a template for us to understand here that Paul fleshes out. And it's similarly, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter addresses this issue of husbands and wives. In verse 15, Paul starts out, he says that we're to be paying careful attention. Pay careful attention then, church. He's speaking to the whole of the church. He's talking to the, 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 the entire Ephesians church, and he's telling them to pay attention to how they walk, how they live their lives. And this instruction to women this morning is needed to be understood in the context of the larger instruction of how do we live wisely in this world? How do we live as wise people of God in a world that is going counter to what God's design is? He says that at the end of verse 15, he says, not as unwise, but as wise. And so we need to pay careful attention to how we live wisely and how do we do that? He says, well, we do that being filled with the Spirit. He encourages them to not be drunk with wine. In other words, don't be controlled by an external substance, but be controlled with an internal substance uh, to be filled with the Spirit. In our study in 1 Corinthians, we talked about to be a spiritual person is to be a supernaturally filled Holy Spirit person. You cannot be a spiritual person without the Holy Spirit. It's just, it's just ne necessary. And so Paul exhorts to live wisely in the power of the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Spirit living wisely in an age that is, how does he describe it? Evil, because the days are evil, making the most of the time. That means that there's, there's, a, there's a brevity to our life, and so as we live, we're to live wisely. Why? So that the world would see the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would see the beautiful thing that God calls us to, back to, essentially, the design that was original. And so to live unwisely would be to live contrary to God's commands or purposes. Psalm 1.6 says that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. We know that we are righteous in Christ, and so we're not earning righteousness, but he says that the Lord looks out after those who live according to his law. And so as we live according to the commands of Christ, that means that we are living wisely, and God is going to do what is good for us. You have to remember that God is... His intention is not for uh, our harm, it's for our good. Uh, don't we know that like, when we have a relationship with somebody, our intentions are for the, the good? That's why it's always important to remember that we need to think about the intentions of someone's heart. They may, not do, some, they may do something that seems uh, like it's confusing or we may not understand, but when someone loves us and has a consistent pattern of loving us, we know that the intention of their heart is not to harm but for good. In a greater sense, 
God is always doing what is good for us. And so when he instructs us, he's pointing us to something that is good for us. The question is, will you trust him? Do you think that he's wise enough to in, give you instructions and a roadmap for life to say, this is actually going to play out well for you? The way of the wicked, Psalm 1, 6 says, leads to ruin. It leads to death. Proverbs 1, 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. So Paul is saying, live wisely underneath the instructions of the Lord. It is wise for husbands to love your wife as Christ loves the church. There's a structure here that God is saying, this is the wisdom of uh, what I want you to, to, to live in, and it will go well with you. And so there's wisdom, Paul says, in submitting to one another. He ends that passage and says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Doing what? Look at verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's, there's joy in our, our hearts. We are singing songs to one another about the goodness of God. We just did that. That's what we were doing. We were singing about the glory of God singing and making music with our heart to the Lord, speaking truth, giving thanks always, and verse 21, submitting to one another. There's the broader context. That submission is a corporate mutual submission, which we'll see and we'll define what does that actually mean. But in the broader context, the church lives wisely when we do this and live this way. In fact, verse 21 drives the context for all that Paul is driving towards. A, a submission to one another in the ordained structures of authority for the church will help a church to grow and be healthy and flourish and be faithful to the message of the gospel. We cannot do this apart from the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, that's why I said this is a supernatural wisdom of submission. Supernatural because we cannot love one another, we cannot submit to one another, we cannot do these things unless the Lord in his power leads us. And so the question would beg is, how often do you depend on your own power in your own life to do the things that God's called you to versus the power of the Holy Spirit? And how well is it going if you're trying to do things in your own power? Oftentimes we need to look at our lives and say, hey, in all honesty, am I trying to do this in my own power? Am I trying to love my wife, love my kids? Am I trying to accomplish the things that God has called me to in my own power. And how do you know that it's in your own power? Well, when you fail to read God's word, when you fail to pray, when you fail to fellowship with the believers, you're doing it on your own. That's what that looks like. So if you have very little time reading your Bible, if you have very little time praying and talking to God, if you are not in the fellowship of other believers, you, my friend, are doing it on your own. And you are not called to do that. Now, The reality is that sometimes we do all of that and we still fail, which is why we have the gospel, which is why there's grace. And so Paul begins to give instructions about the authority levels of the church, which leads us to number two. What does submission? He begins to talk about the context of marriage. And he begins in verse 22 saying, wives, now wives as part of the church, being filled with the Spirit, hupatasso, hupatasso. He uses that word hupatasso, which is translated submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, when we get to this portion, we, also, we have to understand that like, as he goes down the authority structure, he's starting with marriage. And he spends very little time with the wife. In fact, he spends more words on the husbands, which Ricky started with last week. It was a difficult text, I know, Ricky, to do. I'm, thank you for leaving this easy text for me. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but really, both are uh, pointing to something that is beyond just wife and husband. I thought hopefully we've laid that foundation. That's why we've, we've laid that foundation of marriage has a template. It's Christ in the church, which helps us to orient ourselves to when we, when we feel that resistance in, in us, when we hear that, we're, we, that uh, wives submit to your husband, you're going to feel the tension because culturally, culturally we live in a different age. And we want to import our understanding of how things work and, and we want to assume that their thinking and understanding and that the context of the audience here is the same as ours, but it's not. But that doesn't mean that the principle here is, is any different. 
So that's what we do. When we approach the scriptures, we got to find out, okay, what's the context? What's Paul speaking to? Who's he speaking to? And then figure out if there's anything that can translate into our modern age. And is there anything that we can understand that is not necessarily transferable? Some interpreters would take this text and say, hey, there's several reasons why Paul has given this instruction to women. You know, and at that time, there are a few reasons that were appropriate then, but they're not appropriate now because we know better. We're we're much more wiser than they are. We uh, clearly have more education available. We are no longer in need of this authority structure. How do we think of this text differently? And Paul must not have known better. But if Paul's instructions were purely based in culture or just pragmatic reasons, like you know that women needed men to protect them and care for them then, so that's why Paul gave that instruction, but they don't need that now, and so uh, we don't need to understand. They don't need to do this submission. That's, that's if we understand submission in the wrong way. Uh, it's also not taking uh, into account what Paul has instructed a husband to do, which is to lay his life down sacrificially for her, which makes what this word is easy to do if there is a, a counter to that Wait, that there is a balance there where if the husband is doing his role well, she can do her role well, and there's a beautiful thing that is pictured there. Paul is undoubtedly thinking about not culture, but the whole of Scripture. And he quotes in verse 31, Genesis 2.24, where he says that the husband, as was Adam, he uses this in Corinthians, he uses this in Romans, he uses this understanding that God has sovereignly ordained in creation a man, and then out of the man, a woman. And from that, even Jesus says, a man will leave his family and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And Adam has a responsibility over Eve, and the two together, as co-laborers, work together for the glory of God. But there is a divinely ordered structure, and it is good. And so what Paul does here is he introduces what is uh, an analogy to Christ. He uses it for force. He says, as to the Lord. And then He says, as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. And so then he says, so as a church submits to Christ, so wives also you are to submit as covenantal partners with your husband to your own husbands in everything. So when we think about this analogy, it's important to us to understand that just because Paul uses an analogy to Christ doesn't mean that that's not the thing that binds it. What binds it is the principle. The, the principle, in other words, what Paul is pointing to. Because we could take things in Scripture and say, well, you know, if Jesus did this, then we ought to do that. If Jesus fasted for 40 years, like Jesus, we, 40 days, we ought to also fast for 40 days. That's, that's a poor analogy. But when the principle is able to be translated, then we can say, okay, this, this is something that we can translate into our own lives that we ought to do. And that's what Paul is doing. Paul is saying, there's a force here. I want you to understand, as he does for the husband, what it means for submission to look like. And so, what does submission here mean here? Well, it's not subjection. It's not subjection. The, the word here is, is not a forced or begrudging submission to authority, but it is actually a willful and appropriate submission within the context of a proper uh, authority structure. It's, it is a f- spirit-filled submission. In the active sense, this word would be used to cause something to come into subjection. In fact, we see the word used in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, where Paul said, like, if you make a left-hand turn, you'll see the word there. Uh, look at chapter 1, verse 22 with me really quick. Paul is talking about... Um, the power of Christ being seen in his resurrection. And because of his resurrection and ascension, he is now seated on the throne and everything is under his dominion. And it says that God, verse 22, and he, he, talking about the Father, subjected everything under Christ his son's feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church. So in, from the very beginning, Paul is thinking in terms of how do I get this Ephesians church, this church in Ephesus, to understand that Christ is the resurrected Lord, and under him, all dominion, everything. He's the head of it. And so we order our lives in subjection to him. Paul does not say, husbands, subject your wife. That's not what he's saying. That's not the language he uses here. It's not a forced subjection. 
if he wanted to say that, he would have said that. He would have said, husbands, subject your wife. You see this in Islam. Islam, Muslims, husbands, subject your wife. Keep them in order. Keep your entire family in order. It's, it's similar to how we feel when we want to subject our day to our preferences, right? When you order your day and you, you have on your iCal a structure of the schedule that you would prefer to have, but then some, this happens and that happens, there's larger traffic, then you're late to this work, and then, then your kid forgets something at school, but then somebody interrupts your conversation and then it backs up your day and you're like, this day did not go the way that I wanted to. I wanted to subject my time and my order. In the same way, God has subjected everything under the sun, but he has not called the husband to subject his wife. He is encouraging and asking the wife in honor of his son to subject herself willingly and lovingly to an authority that has been commanded to love his wife as Christ has loved the church. Husbands, lay your life down for your wife. Wives, would you submit yourself to a man who will die for you as the church submits herself to the one who has died? And we see this in uh, this form of submission, Philippians 2, 3, consider others better than yourselves as Christ lowered himself. Matthew 10, 26, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be great, they must be a servant to all men, a servant to others. Diakono, to serve, to come under, to, to come under with the purpose of lifting up. 1 Peter 5, 5, Peter says, elders, be kind to the younger men in your church. Don't subjugate them. Don't do it unwilling. Don't, don't like lord it over them. But at the same time, he calls the younger men and the church to submit to your elders as they're trying to pastor you and shepherd you and speak. So when they speak truth and it hurts, don't just punch them in the face. Submit yourself to their instruction and hear and listen. Galatians 3, 4, grace to you and peace. From God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God the Father. This is the will of God the Father, that as Christ gave himself up, husbands, you too give yourself up. Wives, now look to that model and put yourself, as the church puts herself into his loving hands, would you do the same? Now, Paul says to submit to the husband in everything. What is that word, everything? That word, everything, there is all aspects of life together. What that does not mean is that uh, there's no picking and choosing which areas you may or may not want to submit yourself in that relationship as a helpmate, as a, as a co-laborer with your husband. You have a complementary role to play, but you can't just pick and choose which thing you're going to participate and which thing you're not going to participate in. It's, it's an all or nothing. It's a language saying, hey, you're all in. You're all in. You don't say, till, you know, maybe death do we part. We say, no, no, to, I'm in it to the end. I'm in it to win it. Here we go. Let's, let's do it. You, it's not like getting halfway and be like, let's turn back. Although sometimes that happens and that's painful. That's why it's painful. Because when someone gives us their word that they're in it, then we expect them to. There's a, there's a joy there that we're all in, in everything, every aspect of the room. A loving, yielding submission say, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm willing to follow your lead. And Paul here is giving this instruction to them, and he refers back to Genesis chapter 2 when he says the, the husband is head of the wife. We have to think back to how has God created man and wife. He has created them what? In the image of God, we have created them. So there is no devaluing of a woman because she was created out of Adam. It is actually an equal value. Ladies, you are of absolute equal value to the man. Stop. You are also co-laborers with a man. Stop. There's, there's no devaluing here, but there are complementary roles here. And so when a wife hears this, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, and because the husband is the head of the wife, here it is a, refer a referral back to understanding that you have absolute value. This is the good design of God. He is the savior of his body. It's self-care. He is, he is loving his body, and so he's giving goodness. Now, verse 24, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives, lovingly yield yourself to your husbands in everything. Don't 
pick and choose. Be a helpmate. Be a teammate. Be the one that comes alongside and says, as you follow Christ, I will trust you. What this does not mean is that this does not mean that you do not have a voice. It does not mean that your submission doesn't give you the opportunity to argue for a better way. This does not mean that you are to be ignored. This means that you have a voice. This means that you are to participate. But in some ways and sometimes, uh, there will come a point where there's an impasse and there's just disagreement. Ultimately, the, the, the authority and the responsibility falls on a husband to say, well, I'm going to trust the Lord in this way. Will you follow me? And then to let that happen and play out. And that's difficult sometimes. There's a lot of times uh, when Danae and I are kind of divided on maybe something that we might, may or may not do. And uh, we, we have come to an impasse. And that sometimes she has a better idea. And my yielding to that idea is not my uh, abdication of my role or my authority or my lover. It is actually I'm honoring the fact that she has come up with a better idea. Let's just be honest. 97% of the time, the ladies come up with a better idea. It is more strategic, more effective. And I will have spent 15 minutes explaining things. She says, well, why don't we just do it this way? And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine. We could do it that way. It's much easier. And then after it all works out, I just lovingly and kindly say, I'm so grateful I came up with that idea. <laughs> that's not true at all. That would be the opposite of what I'm trying to say. Men, you are not showing weakness when you partner with your wife and allow her to have a conversation about what it is that you may or may not do or should do. That's not what this is talking about. This is, again, the intentions of the heart. Do you want to honor Christ by honoring the other and allowing the gifts to play out? There are certain gifts that, that your wife may have that are, that are better than yours. That are just, there are complementary roles. There are things that they do that are better, but that does not make her greater. Just as you have some gifts that might be better, that does not make you greater. It is a yielding to one another in the context of marriage. And so, number three, how do we do this? So it is, it is a wise submission to the husband. Why? Because the world lives in a, in a totally opposite way. We demand our way, and we demand that there's equal opportunity across the board, no difference whatsoever. When we erode the differences between men and women, husbands and wives, and say there's absolutely no difference whatsoever, we begin to see the problems that that incurs, that there is impasse, there's demanding of one's own way, there is, is a confusion, there's, there's a lack of knowledge of, of what is right and what is good. And so God has ordered something for us that is wise to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to present to the world something that is beautiful. So finally, what is, how do we supernaturally, wives, how do you, being absolutely equal with men in terms of value, but different in role, how do you, as created by God, to be in this role, if God has called you to be in this role, how do you do this? How do you live in this way that is wise? And how do you live it out? How do you supernaturally and wisely submit to your husband. Well, Jesus is our example. So let's look to Jesus. Let's look to Jesus as our model. If a, if a wise, supernaturally filled woman who serves as a wife chooses to lovingly submit to her husband, she must do it like Christ, just as the husband is to love like Christ. And so how does Christ love his father? How, how did Christ model this lovingly yielding to the will of the Father, his authority, though they are equal, but they are different in role, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in one God, one God loving each other perfectly, using their gifts and their abilities and their powers to particular roles, but yet they are equal in person. Lord, what does this look like in the life of a marriage? And specifically, how does the love of Christ look played out through the wife? Well, we look at it as a love that is consistent, it is respectful, and it is cheerful. The submission that is loving is consistent, respectful, and cheerful. And if we see these things, we see a glimpse of Christ who did the same. John 5.19 shows us the consistency of Jesus' submission. Jesus replied to some people, 
uh, who were asking, like, and what power is he doing these things? He says, truly, I tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. So for whatever the father does, the son, like Lois, does these things. He consistently said, this is my father's will, not my own. Jesus, why don't you do this? Well, that's not what my father would have. He consistently walked this out. And so we look at him and we say, man, Jesus was consistently following the will of the Father. And, and how did that play out? It played out rather well for us, didn't it? He was also respectful. Mark 14, 36 shows us the respect of Christ for his Father in Gethsemane. Jesus prayed, Abba, Father. Some people take that as a daddy. That's not daddy, actually. That translation is not a loving, emotional kind of daddy. Let me crawl up into your lap. It's actually a respectful term. It's Abba, Father head of the household, one who orders all of his family in perfection, one who provides, one who is guarding the, the children, one who father, father in the Mediterranean had a much stronger term. If you, you still see it to this day. You still go to the Middle East and you will see a good father in a, in a Middle Eastern family care for his wives, care for his children, care for his daughters-in-law, care for their children. He puts them in his household. In fact, we see that in the fact that he provides enough safety and security for the entirety of the family. Jesus says, Father, the one who's over all things, what does he say? Respectfully, all things are possible for you, but if this is able to pass, please take this cup away from me, but yet, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He submits to the Father's will. And finally, we see the joy, the cheerfulness of Christ. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses, after the writer of Hebrews has said, there is a witness to the glory of Christ, that Christ is better than the law, Christ is better than Moses, he's better than all things, his blood reconciles us back. Therefore, let us lay aside everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that led before him, that laid before him, he endured the cross. There was a joy there that he knew that in following the Father's will and submitting himself to the Father, he was gonna accomplish a far greater task than he could ever do if he abdicated the will of the Father. Jesus was consistent in his submission to the Father. Jesus was respectful to his Father, knowing that the Father's will was for the greater good, and he was cheerful doing it, that even as he goes to the cross, there was joy in his heart, knowing that those of us who look to him would have eternal life. And so, when Paul is presenting this larger picture of marriage to us today. He's written this to the, the Ephesians church. He's saying, when you live in this world, live wisely. And when you order your marriages this way, when wives, you live in this way, cheerfully and respectfully and consistently submitting yourself to your husband in the way that Christ would have you submit to him. And husbands, as you love your wives unconditionally, sacrificially, and purifyingly, this is a beautiful picture of the gospel, which calls us to basically call out the reality that marriage is not always this rosy of a picture, is it? It's not always this way. If nothing of what has been presented over the last few weeks is even remotely close to what your marriage is, that's okay because the good news of the gospel is that our marriages are not without hope. None of our marriages are without hope. If you are on the last straw, the last string, if your marriage is falling apart and you and you is barely held together with scotch tape, there's still hope. There's always hope. Because the power of the gospel is such that when you submit yourself, both man and woman, husband and wife, to the will of the Father, which is the will of Christ, Peter promises that if we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, he will lift us up in due time. Humble submission for the church. So now we zoom out. We've We've focused in on the wife, but really the reality is that all of us submitting to one another humbly submit ourselves because under the mighty hand of God, he will lift us up. He will heal us. He will resurrect us. He will, he will make it worth our while that we lay down our lives in submission to his will and not our own. Isn't this good news? You need not be without hope. 
individually, as a single, corporately as a church, together in marriage. Admittedly, this puts you ladies in a vulnerable position. This is an admittedly uh, sensitive instruction because to, to submit yourself to something means that you're, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position. It's just the way that it is because your husband could fail you. Your friend can fail you. Everything can fail you. Business can fail you. But ladies, you put yourself in a position which is all the more while why husbands need to pursue Christ because this does not work if it's not a two-way street. It's not 50-50. It's all in. I'm all in for Christ. We're both all in for Christ. And even though Danae may do a few things that are fairly off kilter and I have to, no, I'm just kidding. Just reverse that, and it's probably that's way more true. Sorry, babe. I got. I mean, I got to say, I only have my own marriage as an example, and I, I can't, I can't tell you how many times that I regret not li- loving like Christ. And if, and if any man does not admit that, then perhaps maybe the spirit of God is not in your heart, because. Because when he makes our hearts sensitive to the, the movings of the Holy Spirit, all we can do is basically see that we have such a, a role to play for our kids. Paul will go down and he'll give instruction for the children as well. First in marriage, so in the context of marriage, first the task of loving each other this way, all of these instructions, it's impossible to do apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, folks. That's why we spend so much time in the gifts of the Holy Spirit that without the Holy Spirit, you can't do this. Second, this task of loving each other is is impossible to to do alone. You cannot do this alone as a couple or individually. And so you need to seek the help in the consistent community of other believers in the local church, small group, to help you, to guide you, to give you advice. Men, we need other men who are 10 years, 20 years ahead of us, giving us some seasoned counsel, some veterans in our life, an older guy to say, you know, uh, here, yeah, I've made a few of those same mistakes, and here's what you need to do to, to right them. I've made them. And history has found that no matter how long advice has been passed down from man to man, they still make the same mistakes over and over again. Women, you need older women in your life. That's why Paul writes to Titus the instruction of women who can disciple other women. Yes, they, they need to say men consistently struggle with these things, and here's how you fix them. It takes a while for them to get the hang of it, but here's some advice and what you need to be, in, be patient with and how to help and to love and, and to, to nurture your marriage. And so we can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this w- alone. And third, let me just save you the grief of worrying that you will fail to do all of these things perfectly. This is not a call to, if you do this, Jesus will love you more. This is, as you grow in this, in the years to come, there will be struggles, but yet there will bear good fruit. It will bear good fruit if you pursue this. It will be something beautiful. When a Christ-centered husband wisely chooses to love his wife just as Christ loved the church unconditionally, sacrificially, and purifyingly, and a Christ-centered wife wisely chooses to lovingly submit to her husband just as Christ lovingly submitted to his father consistently, respectfully, and cheerfully, we see a beautiful picture of the gospel. Let us pray that God would give us the great privilege of living that out. 